morning, I'm going to go to the Please stand here. Oh, 
service and welcome to those of you watching later online and on YouTube. I'm glad to have you also. I've got a few updates. Uh, first we'll see some pictures from the Easter Hawk uh, yesterday. I'd like to really thank all those that helped organize that came out and um, showed Jesus' love in the community. <laughs> Just an awesome event. And again, thanks everyone for showing Jesus' love to the community. Children third grade and under can now be dismissed for Children's Church. And if you are here in person, if you'll take just a moment, fill out your connect cards in the back of your bulletin. Um, you can leave them on a seat and an usher will get them at the end of service. This is the week for the Living Last Supper, and I believe we have a video. It's going to give us some information on that. Hi, I'm Tracy Gibson. Have you heard of the painting, The Last Supper, by Leonardo da Vinci? I'm sure you probably have. <laughs> have you ever wondered what it would be like to be one of the disciples in that moment when Jesus reveals that one of them will be his betrayer? I know I've certainly wondered what that was like. You can come experience that with us at Mount Eva Church on April 6th or April 7th for two separate productions of The Living Last Supper where the disciples come to life and speak their mind and their feelings during this pivotal moment. What better way to celebrate our risen Savior? So again, that's this week, Thursday and Friday. I invite your friends and family out. I think that'll be a blessing. I pray that'll be a blessing to everyone who sees it. Uh, the Hamersville community is having an Easter sunrise worship service again this year. It will be at 7 a.m. at the Hamersville Baptist Church. So again, that's on Easter, 7 a.m. Also, Easter worship services here at Mount Nebo will be the normal 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And there will be a light breakfast served between services from 10 to 11. So there'll be plenty, so invite your friends and family. They all can attend with you next week. That's all I have. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Bill. Good morning on this Palm Sunday. It's good to be with you. I want to uh, just uh, invite you to share any God sightings you might have had this week. And what I mean by that are maybe there are some times this week where God lets you experience, you know, his presence in something that happened or just you know, in your devotional time, something you read or your prayer time that just, where you just knew the Lord was right there. If you'd like to share something like that and give thanks to him, why raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Anybody? Any God sightings? All right, well, let's have prayer together, okay? I didn't want to, I didn't want to rush you, no pressure on you. And, and maybe it just kind of caught you off guard. But I know the Lord is always in, at work, isn't he? Let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness to us that uh, in, in the moments of life where we may be seeking after you 
in times of prayer or in scripture reading or in serving or things like that, or even in moments when we're going about our, our routine of the day, and you unexpectedly just remind us that you're right there with us. God, we just thank you for all those times where you reveal yourself to us. And God, we thank you most of all for how you did that through Jesus, your son. Father, may you be well pleased with our hearts and with our expressions of worship that we offer to you today. We do uh, pray now for a couple of folks who are healing up from surgery. We think of Addison Brzezini and Sarah Moeller, both who are recovering from surgery. Thank you that they're doing well. We just know that they're doing well because of your blessing, and we thank you for that. God, we pray for Dan Kirshner. will be having a injection in his back tomorrow to help him to be able to get ease of pain and be able to resume better mobility. We pray also for Tina Schramm, who will be having procedure done on nerves in her back on Tuesday, or for both of these people. We pray for your healing touch for them. We also want to pray for Seth Colliver, uh, grand, grandson of Phyllis Colliver. We just pray for Seth as he's in Children's Hospital uh, dealing with COVID and, and already had compromised health because of his disabilities. And we just pray for your mercy and grace upon this young man. Lord Jesus, would you, uh, you know, just cover him with your Holy Spirit and care for his needs. Bless his parents and bless his family as they wait upon him as well. And Lord, we pray for the, the opportunities coming up this week. Uh, for worship and for ministry. We think of the Living Last Supper this Thursday and Friday and then Easter uh, sunrise service, Sunday morning services, special times of, of worship, Lord, where, where uh, Lord, we, we not only look forward to being together and meeting with you, but also we think of folks in our community and, and pray for them and pray that you would use these uh, ministry and worship events as, as part of your way to just reach out to people with the, the real love of Jesus Christ, your son. Help us to be a part of that. Father, we pray that you would also bless the reading of scripture today. Lord, it's, uh, we, we ask that, that, that you would stir our hearts with it today. Send your Holy Spirit to just awaken us in, in deeper ways to you and to what you want to do in us as you endeavor to transform us more and more into the image of Jesus, your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, speaking of uh, Easter, Easter Sunday, I just want to uh, remind you that as always as a congregation, we, we want to always extend a, a welcome to people on behalf of God. A welcome that's, uh, you know, that's an expression of his love for people. We always want to do that every, every Sunday for any guests that may come and join us. But typically we have more guests join us on Easter. And so with, with that in mind, I want to ask you to do two things. Park in the back and sit in the front. You ready? You got it? Park in the back, sit in the front. And, and that's because, you know, we want our guests to find parking spots easily and find those up front. You may arrive way before the service and then it seems like there are plenty of spots. It's amazing how many people will arrive right at top, right on time or just a little bit after time and that's fine. But, but don't assume that there will be spots for people. So make spots for them. If you are able to walk a little bit, park in the gravel lot and walk, walk over here to make room for folks. We'll typically have 300 to 350 people here on a Sunday morning, and here lately we've been averaging around 190 to 200, so we're going to have 150 to 200 more people than we normally have. So just be ready for that. Park in the back, sit in the front. It's, it's most comfortable for guests when it's their first time here or you know, second time or whatever. It's most comfortable for them to sit in the back, and that's fine. Don't make them sit up front. If you sit in the back, they're going to have to sit up front. 
And, and they're going to be closer to me than they probably want to be. So don't do that to them, okay? Don't do that to them. Make room for them in the back. And, and then greet as many people as you can on Sunday morning. Our tendency is when the greeting time is being held, that we go to people that we normally talk to and we, we want to you know, say hi to them. We know them. We want to talk to them. That's fine. But don't stop there. You be sure and get around to folks that, you know, guests that have come, people you don't know yet. Get around to them and make them feel welcome. Just greet as many people as possible. Okay, you got it? So park where? <laughs> Sit where? <laughs> you got it. All right, we're ready. All right. I want to ask a question of you. Have you ever created a stir? Have you ever created a stir? You know what I'm talking about. It's, have you ever created a commotion? Have you ever done something that caused you know, people's attention to shift your way? Have you ever created a stir? There were a couple of stirs created at the Easter egg hop, car, Easter egg car hop yesterday. And, and by the way, I wanted to uh, just thank Brenda Reed, our discipleship coordinator, for organizing another great uh, ministry event that welcomed people to come and blessed families and but also thanks to everybody that was a part of serving those of you that came and offered eggs to children and helped with the setup and all that kind of stuff thank you it, it, uh, just well done will you will you give yourselves a hand if that was you and other people if, 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 that, that was well done it was a tough day to have an event outside you remember the wind yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we saw Easter eggs flying across the parking lot. You know, baskets would get tipped over. The wind caught those eggs, and they were rolling, rolling, rolling. Saw one attached to a balloon, and it took off and headed that direction. I thought, sure, it was going to get hung up on a car. It got to the car and went right over the car, and it just kept on. Boy, the wind was a challenge. But uh, you showed up and, and uh, just made it happen. It was, it was great. But one of the stirs that was created was created by a person in an Easter Bunny costume. And uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but they came with Johnny Davis, if you know Johnny. <laughs> the person in the Bunny costume came with Johnny Davis. We have a picture to show you. And I'm going to ask for several pictures coming up, so just kind of be ready. So here's the, here's the, the Easter Bunny. And, and, and several people enjoyed getting their picture taken with the bunny. You know, would go up and stand there and get picture taken, and several of the children enjoyed that. But some of some of our really young children cried when they saw the Easter Bunny. I mean, so there was a stir created on both sides. People couldn't wait to get to the Easter Bunny, and then there was a stir created from, from little children that cried. I saw one parent hand the Easter Bunny a child, and immediately they looked at the, just started crying, ah! you know, you know, a poor, poor child. And then I saw another child, and uh, Joe, it was your daughter, Briella, and they, the way it was set up, cars were in the parking lot, children came in from this side, walked around the parking lot, and then back out. The Easter Bunny was parked about right out here, okay? So I saw uh, Joe and, and uh, Briella and uh, uh, Brindley come in, and, and Briella saw the Easter Bunny right away. Easter Bunny was clear over here. And that little one-and-a-half-year-old Briella, right? She's about one-and-a-half. She turned over there and looked at her. I mean, and she'd walk on and pick up an egg. She'd look over at that Easter Bunny again. She'd keep walking. Just like, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that thing. I don't know what it is, but I'm keeping an eye on it. She walked all around the parking lot like that. It was hilarious to see that. I mean, you can no wonder some children would cry because you're you say you're one and a half year old, you've never seen anything like this before. An oversized animal that acted like a human. That's not that's not normal. And then the thing has a fixed expression on its face. It talks, but its lips don't move. I mean, none of that is natural, and, and I, I couldn't blame her for just not being able to take her eye off of that, that bunny. I wouldn't want that bunny to sneak up on me either. So, you know, that, that created a stir. Well, there was something else that created a stir as well, and it was actually a, a little lamb, a one-month-old lamb that 
Shelby and Alyssa and Jen and Julia Eubanks brought. We have a picture of it. There we go. There it is right there. And you'll see it's got a collar on it and it was on a leash. And uh, the Eubanks told me that this little lamb was rejected by its mother when it was born. And so they bottle fed that lamb from day one. And it is so familiar with people. It, it just follows people around. It wants you to pet it. It was, it was so cute and, and it created quite a stir. You know, all the kids just want to get over there and, and pet that lamb. And that was, that was neat to see. But those two things quite, caused quite a stir at the Easter egg hop yesterday. One Sunday, Jesus caused a stir. He caused a big stir uh, the day that he entered into Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday. So I want to invite you to come and see what the Apostle Matthew wrote about it in Matthew chapter 21. If you're able, would you please stand as I read from Matthew chapter 21. I'll invite you to follow along too. And as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone, uh, if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to, say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the, on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked. This, the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You may be seated. The Jewish capital city of uh, Jerusalem is where all of this took place. And uh, it, it's, re, you know, this event we just read about in Scripture is referred to as the triumphal entry. And as I said before, of course, we refer to this day as Palm Sunday. And again, it all took place in Jerusalem. But for Jesus and his 12 disciples, Matthew tells us that their journey began in Jericho. It started in Jericho. Their journey to Jerusalem started in Jericho. Uh, because that's where the main road to Jerusalem started, was, was there in that town. And since it, it was almost time for the Passover, by the way, the Passover celebration, the Jewish Passover celebration was the biggest Jewish celebration of the year. And because it was almost time for that, a lot of people were walking that same road, or would have been walking the same road that Jesus and his disciples walked. Now, we, get, we have something in mind when we think of, we see in Scripture that, you know, Jesus and his disciples walked on a road. We have in mind what we understand roads to be today or maybe what a hiking trail looked like or something like that. But it's quite different than we might expect. Uh, the, the road from Jericho to Jerusalem was 17 miles long and basically that would have been uh, a day's walk because not only was it 17 miles long, it was 3,000 foot climb in elevation. And so you hear often in Scripture, it's referred to when people go to Jerusalem, it's often said that they went up to Jerusalem. That's because of the elevation climb. They went up to Jerusalem. I have some pictures of, of that road. Here's a, a picture of the, the road, part of the road today. And so you, you, you see uh, you know, where the ancient road is pointed out there. This is just part of it. And then you see at the very top an arrow pointing to the Mount of, of Olives. And so you see the kind of terrain that we're talking about. And then I have another picture 
of, of that road from a different angle. And you can see, you know, because it's an arid desert type uh, area, what it, uh, what it looks like. So it was not an easy road to, to walk, uh, but, uh, and then there's another picture, the side view actually. Here's a, an idea of the elevation climb. Jericho is actually below sea level. It's inland, and the, the, the Mediterranean Sea is actually higher than Jericho, but you know, it start, they started at Jericho, would have gone up, and so it wasn't just a steady climb up. It was up, and there were some downs, and some ups and downs, and rough, and so you, you get an idea of, of why it would have been a, a day's journey to get there. Now, in the Old Testament, God commanded that the, the Jewish people participate in the Passover celebration every year. And, and, and every Jewish male who could possibly get to Jerusalem, to the temple, for that celebration was supposed to be there. And if they could bring their families, great. But if, if they couldn't, for one reason or another, another, they were supposed to go anyway. And they were supposed to make certain sacrifices to worship the Lord in the temple in, in Jerusalem. And, and those sacrifices could be at what was called an unblemished lamb, a, a one-year-old lamb, your best one, not your worst one, not the one you wanted to get rid of anyway, not the one with some kind of defect, but a one-year-old lamb that was, that was unblemished. Or if you couldn't afford that, you were to take two turtle doves, and those would be brought to the temple, to the priests. They would sacrifice those, those animals, and, and their blood would be, you know, uh, you know sprinkled on the, the altar there. Then they were to take the meat, to a place where home if, or, or wherever they were staying and they were to roast that meat and eat it that evening with their families if they had them with, with them uh, friends, whoever they were staying with they were to eat that meal together in remembrance of something God did back in Egypt and that was when God sent, just before God sent the tenth plague on Egypt remember nation of Israel were enslaved in Egypt and, and God was setting them free from that slavery that in, in Egypt and he did that. Pharaoh didn't want to do it. He was powerful and he resisted God. Moses kept going, Pharaoh, you know, God said, let people go. No, I'm not going to do it. God kept sending plague after plague. Finally, the last one broke Pharaoh's will and he let people go. That last plague was the plague of death, death of all the firstborn. And so before the plague came, uh, God sent it. Uh, he told the people of Israel, take uh, a lamb, sacrifice it, take the blood from the lamb, put it over the doorpost of where you're staying, eat that roasted lamb that night, and when I send the death angel there to kill the firstborn, that death angel will pass over your home. That's the name for that Jewish feast. The Passover. And so... The, uh, that's what the, the, the and then God commanded the Jewish people to remember that every year, every year, and, and reenact that that feast together. Uh, and so that particular year, uh, where the Passover was uh, approaching, was the third year that Jesus had been preaching about the kingdom of God. The third year that he'd been performing signs and miracles, signs, those miracles were signs basically pointing to who he was as the son of God. And, and most Jews had heard about him, at least heard about him, if not seen him, heard him preach. And, and some were wondering that year if, if he would be in Jerusalem for that Passover. And there was a question whether he would be there or not because a lot of the Jewish leaders hated him. He was becoming, uh, you know, popular and the people were following him and believing he was the son of God and they they, the Jewish leaders resisted that and they wanted to kill Jesus. And, uh, but among the common people, there was a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors. You know, will he be there? I don't know. I think he'll be there. Maybe not. Uh, you know, will he make an announcement that he's the Messiah, the Savior? We don't know. There's, there's a lot of speculation. <coughs> a lot of tension that particular year leading up to the Jewish Passover. And so on that Sunday, before the Passover, Jesus, Jesus riding into Jerusalem the way he did caused a big stir. 
And, and that's because of the way that he did it. He did it in a way that God said his Messiah would do uh, when he came. And Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, is a, a, a reference to a prophecy that God led Zechariah to make 480 years before this. He said, this is how, God basically said through Zechariah, this is how the Messiah will come. Let's have that scripture up there, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the Jews knew this prophecy. They knew it. And, and they knew it was a sign from God that, that Jesus was the one. When they saw him riding in, they knew that he was, was the one. And they knew that he was announcing, that he was intentionally saying, I am the one and, and I'm, I'm the one that you've been waiting for that God would send. And so they shouted, just like Zechariah said that they would. They shouted, Hosanna, son of David. They shouted, bless the sea who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They shouted. So Jesus made quite a stir in Jerusalem. And that day, uh, the people cheered him on. I mean, it was a day they had prayed for. It was a day that had finally arrived. Now, at that point in history, the country of Israel was nothing. It was nothing as far as world powers go. Like several other nations, they had been conquered by the Romans. And they were just like a puppet on a string. Uh, they didn't have their own king. The reason they didn't have their own king is not because they didn't want one. It's because Rome wouldn't let them have, have one. Uh, they did have a high priest, which was sort of a religious, political kind of leader. But they were only allowed to have the one uh, that Rome approved. And, uh, and then, not only that, but to make sure that the uh, Jews behaved themselves and there weren't any uprisings or revolts or anything like that, to make sure of that, Rome had built, the Romans had built a fortress, a Roman fortress, onto the side of the temple. Again, get that. That would be like having a church building and our nation was occupied by another nation and we didn't have our freedoms. That would be like some other nation coming in, building a fortress, building a fort on the side of our church building and keeping watch on us so that we only did what they wanted us to do. How would that feel? That didn't feel too good to them. It was a real slap in the face. We have a picture of that fortress. It's called the Antonia Fortress. It's a drawing, actually. And you can see the, the temple on the, the upper part there, or part of the, the temple court there. And that fortress was positioned right there with the towers of that fortress being high enough that, that the soldiers, 600, by the way, would occupy that fortress all the time. And they could look down on what was going on in the temple. Big Brother was watching. That was, that was the state of their nation <clears throat> when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. <laughs> But they hadn't given up hope. They had not because, uh, because they didn't give up hope because of the words of God's prophets like Zechariah. And so they held out hope that one day, someday the Messiah would arrive. And in their minds, they thought he would break them free from the grip of Rome. So that Sunday when Jesus, uh, that Sunday, I should say, Jesus created a stir. And the, the Jews were more or less, when he created that story, I should say, the Jews were more or less thinking and saying, finally, finally he's here. More or less thinking, all right, Rome, there's a new sheriff in town. Now your day's, now your day's coming. He's going to get rid of those evil, ungodly Romans. He's going he's to drive you out of our country. More or less, many of them were thinking that very thing. Because the way they looked at things, the Messiah, the way the Jewish people were looking at things, the Messiah would be for them and he would be against the Romans. But Jesus didn't do what they thought he would do. 
They probably thought he would start by going to the, the Antonia fortress and, and by the power that he had displayed that they either heard about or saw, they probably thought that he would begin to force the Romans out of the country, starting with Jerusalem. But he didn't do that. Why was that? Why didn't he do it? Because Jesus wasn't a, against one group of people over another. Jesus was against sin, not against people. Because he was against sin because he was against the, the thing that separates people from God wherever he found it. And he didn't start with the Romans. He started with the sin of the Jews, the people who should have known better. That's where he started. In the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Peter tells us in chapter 4, verse 7 of 1 Peter, he, he reminds us that God always starts with his people. This, this is what Peter said. For it is time for judgment, speaking of the judgment of God, it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, with God's people, in other words. And sure enough, Jesus started in the temple. And, and what he did, and, and so the, the uh, three verses after what we just read tells about Jesus going into the temple courts and starting, you know, to judge the sin that was there. Let's look at those verses. Chapter 21, verses 12, starting at verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. Temple court. So there it was. Uh, you've probably heard about this before, but Jesus drove out the people who were buying and selling. There was, in a sense, a need for animals to be available for people to buy to offer as sacrifices in the temple. I mean, especially for those who traveled a long distance, right? It would be hard for anybody traveling, you know, 50 miles. 150 miles, 200 miles by foot. It would be hard for any of them to bring a lamb and have it in any kind of good shape once they got there. It would be hard for them to travel and bring a couple of doves and have those doves in any kind of decent shape to offer as a sacrifice by the time they got there. So there was a need for that, but there was no need for it to them to be sold in the temple courts for one thing. And there sure wouldn't be a need for them to be sold at the jacked up prices that were probably a part of what was going on. <clears throat> so by, uh, by the Jews allowing the animals to be sold where they were for the prices that they, they were being sold for, it made it hard for people to do what God asked them to do, to offer those sacrifices. And, and, and outright, some of the poor could not even afford to offer those sacrifices. They just simply did not have the money to be able to do it. And so Jesus sees this going on, and he goes in there, and he starts to upset, um, you know, the, the, the cages of the doves and all that sort of thing, and driving the animals out of the court. But he also upset the... Uh, the, the tables of the money changers. What was that all about? Well, the Jewish leaders forbid people to use Roman and Greek coins in the temple because Roman and Greek coins had the images of some of the, the false gods that the Romans and the Greeks worshipped. And so they said, you can't use those coins in here. They're, they're uh, you know, they're, they're, it's just wrong to use them in here. It was okay for them to charge too much for the animals and all that sort of stuff, but it was wrong for those coins to be used. And so what they'd have to do, people were forced to bring those coins in because the coins, the Roman and Greek coins, were the coins used in trade and the most common coins. And, and so they had to bring those coins in and exchange them for coins that the Jews had, had minted. And guess what? The uh, Jewish religious leaders made money off of that one too. They charged way too much for that 
exchange, that currency exchange. And so we can see why Jesus started in the temple. The Jews should have known better than to use a worship gathering to take advantage of fellow Jews. But it happened. It had happened for years. It had happened all the time to the point that they got used to it and tolerated it. The people just, you know, that's the way it is. And, and they just went on. They accepted it. But they didn't make it right with God. So Jesus rode into town and he confronted the sin of the Jews. Not what they expected, not what they wanted, but he's against sin wherever he finds it. Now, if Jesus rode into one of our cities today, where do you think he would start confronting sin? Where would he start? I think we get the sense from this passage, he would start with the church. That's where he would start. Uh, he would start with the sin and the, any sin and evil that are in the hearts of his followers, like you and me. You, you might think he would start with, you know, you know, us thinking about it. We, you know, the Romans thought, they, or the Jews thought that he would start with Rome. We might think he would start with, if you're a student in school, you might think he would start with the kid in your class who makes your day miserable. That Jesus would start with that kid. Or, you know, if you have a boss that you feel is unjust or unfair, you might think Jesus would start his judgment of sin with somebody like that. Or, or you know, if you have a neighbor that's hard to get along with, you might think Jesus would start with that unbearable neighbor. Or, or you know, when we think about our, our, our country, we might think of, Political leaders who, who seem to be corrupt on a local, state, and national level. We think Jesus would start with them. Or he would start maybe on a world and on a world level that he would start, you know, judging evil leaders like the leaders of Russia, China, and North Korea, and places like that. But uh, I'm pretty sure that Jesus would start with us, aren't you? Because we should know better. He'd start with you. He'd start with me. He'd start with whatever sin and evil we might be tolerating in our hearts and lives. And if right now you're thinking, who, me? What, what sin and evil? You know, I'm pretty good compared to most. Why would he start with me? If that's the way you're thinking, it might be a sign uh, to you that you've gotten used to some things that you shouldn't have gotten used to. It might be a sign of that. Isn't that what happened in the temple? They just got used to some things they shouldn't have gotten used to. We could categorize those kinds of things as spiritual apathy. Uh, you know, just tolerating sins because we think they're small or sins because we've gotten blind to them because we've been a part of it so long. We could categorize those kinds of things as spiritual apathy. And um, uh, if, if, if that's the case, if that's where we ever find ourselves, that might even express itself in how we approach Sunday morning. Maybe we approach Sunday morning as a, uh, you know, with a, with a drive-through worship mentality. I just thought of that this week. Um, you know, if, if we get apathetic in our relationship with the Lord and we tolerate things in our lives and, and Jesus is not, you know, where he needs to be in our lives, we adopt a drive-through worship mentality. Here's what I mean by that. It's a convenience thing. We stop in on Sunday morning and we do what we do at the drive through line. We grab and go. And so on Sunday morning, we come in and we grab a little something for me and we go out the door. And, and you know, what that does is it makes Sunday about us. Is Sunday about us? Not primarily, is it? Sunday is about God. And 
worshiping Him and honoring Him and giving Him the best of our attention, our time, our service, our giving everything that we have, we're giving Him our best Sunday is about Him. But if it becomes a, if Sunday becomes a drive-through worship, you know, if we adopt a drive-through worship mentality, then uh, we, we're not putting uh, worship first. We're not putting blessing God first. We're not putting serving Him first. We're kind of at a place where those Jewish religious leaders were. So basically, if we think, what sin? What evil? In me? Ah. If, if we're, we're saying, no, no, that's, that's not me. I got none of that in me. It might be a sign of an unchanged life. We're saved. We believed in Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior. We're saved, but we're, we're unchanged. We've, we've got to a place somewhere along the line where we put the brakes on and say, Jesus, that's, that's good. I'm good to go. Uh, you know, I, I you know, appreciate who you are and what you've done, but some things just aren't going to change. And, and that's, that's the way I'm going to leave it. The neat thing is, Jesus has our best in mind, doesn't he? He always has our best in mind. Always does. And so part of that is that he loves us too much to leave us where we are. Sometimes I appreciate that, and sometimes I don't. How about you? I mean, there are some times where I'm like, oh, Lord, you know, thanks for calling me up short when I started to think certain things. Lord, thanks for, you know, prompting my heart when my attitude is, is not what it needs to be. God, thanks for, for, you know, convicting me about what I just said to somebody at work or school or whatever. You know, there are times where I'm like, Lord, thank you for, for calling me up short like that. But there's other times where it's like, oh, Lord, not today. I don't, I don't want to hear it. You know, not again. But he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. He wants us to keep growing and growing closer in a relationship with him. And he knows that any sin we tolerate gets between us and God and all the fullness that he wants for us. And, and uh, that's why he's against sin. Because of what it does to us and what it does to the people around us. And so, I want to ask you to do something with me. We put up that next slide. Let Jesus create a stir in you. Let him create a stir in you. That's what he did when he went in the temple that day, wasn't it? Man, create a stir in those people. Trying to get them to think about what they were doing. The sin they were tolerating. Don't let that keep, he didn't want that to keep them from getting closer to him. And he doesn't want that for us either. Let Jesus create a stir in you. More or less say, Lord, where am I tolerating sin? And then if he shows you something, say, Lord, Forgive me. Don't, you know, keep changing me. Don't give up on me. Keep changing me. I, I want my life to be more about blessing you and serving you, Lord. Uh, you know, just cre continue to create a stir in me. Here's one way you can do it this week. We're coming up on, on Easter next Sunday. And, and uh, you, we can change our focus on Easter Follow me, okay? You ready? Follow me here. Change your focus on Easter. Don't make it about what you usually do. Here's what uh, a lot of us do on Easter. It's our normal thing we do on Easter. We have family come with us, and we sit with our family. We take pictures after the service together. We have dinner together afterwards, and we call it a day. That's Easter Sunday. 
And there's nothing wrong with, with this. There's nothing wrong with that kind of thing other than that may be a sign that we're only thinking about us. That's what we usually do. It's been our routine. We've done it for years. Wasn't that what the religious leaders fell into? There's nothing wrong with that kind of thing other than we're only thinking about us and maybe there's people left out that Jesus didn't want us to leave out. So you invite your family, but what about, what about you know, the people around you that you haven't invited before? What about the neighbor or the, the, the person at work or the fa distant family member that maybe you don't get you know, as close to and those kind of things? What about inviting them to come with you? That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? And, and so, who, who would God want me to include in my Easter plans? Who would God want me to invite? But invite them. Include them. Have them sit with you when they come. You and your family. Include them with you and your family. Uh, take pictures with, with, have them take pictures with you and your family. Do that kind of thing. Invite them to dinner with you. All of, all of that. Let Jesus create a stir in you. So much so that you're willing to break your normal routine. That I'm willing to break my normal routine to listen to maybe, you know, who, who's being excluded. The poor were excluded from the temple worship because of how expensive it was. The poor were excluded. The, the socially awkward, the, who knows who it is? Who, who is it that's being excluded that you haven't in, invited before? Invite them. Change up your Easter routine. Let Jesus create a stir in you that ends up affecting who you invite for Easter. You got somebody in mind? I've been thinking about a couple of people and uh, I'm, I'm going to invite them. I don't know if they'll come or not, but I sure hope they do. And I hope, you, hope you're thinking of some folks too. Thank you. 
Thank you. 